All right, so we are in the second part of a series that we just began last week called Embrace the Breaking. And as we march towards Easter, what we want to do is we want to show you these moments in Jesus's life where he shows up in power in the lives of broken people. And the hope is, uh, the hope is that as we uh, are looking at these stories and we're seeing what he's doing in the lives of broken people, that maybe you and I would actually allow him into the broken areas of our lives as well. Amen? That's what we're trying to do here. And so in the last couple of weeks, man, I have been both heartbroken and inspired by the stories that I'm hearing uh, about the violence being inflicted on Ukraine by Russia. Uh, and there's a couple things that have been inspiring uh, in this place. The first thing is the fact that when you think about um, the aid agencies that are able to uh, actually help right now, now you have some of the main players, you have the Convoy of Hope and you have so many others, um, they're not actually able to get into the country, right? Because it's an active war zone. And so all the aid that they're doing is outside of Ukraine. All right. And so we saw this in the video last week. All that aid is happening outside of Ukraine. And so the only active organized network that's, that's actually meeting the needs of people in Ukraine is the church. Amen. That is wild. That is amazing. Um, and so, I, man, I'm, I'm so inspired by that. Uh, another thing is last week we gave an appeal uh, to, to all of us, all right, the appeal was, you know, what can we do to get involved, right? What, what can we do to be a part of the relief efforts? And um, so we, we gave an appeal and we said, man, anything you guys give for uh, global missions, uh, we're going to give. And I just want to tell you guys that last week you guys committed and, and, and within a week we have raised up to $22,000, okay? It's amazing, amazing. So we do have some, uh, some relationships and partnerships with uh, people who are connected to the church uh, in Ukraine. So we're going to be able to get it right to the people who are in the country that are doing the work. Um, and that is because of you guys. That's because of you guys, right? We talk a lot around here about being a family beyond these walls, right? Being a church beyond this building, right? This is what that looks like. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> Another thing that's encouraging to me is uh, Volodymyr Zelensky the president of Ukraine. I don't know if you guys have been following what's going on with him. Um, he was offered an opportunity <clears throat> by the U.S. government to evacuate the country. All right, they were trying to get him out of the country. And the reason why is because he is the number one target of Russia. He's number one. You know what the number two target of Russia is? His family. All right. So he's in grave, grave danger. And so uh, the U.S. government came to him. They said, hey, let us get you out of here. We want to get you out. Now contrast this with the leader of Afghanistan last summer. Okay, Last summer when the Taliban invaded Kabul, you remember what happened, right? That brother was out quick. Okay, He got out. All right? He had the resources to get out of that country. His people didn't, and he left. All right? But when uh, Zelensky was offered an opportunity by America to get out of the country, this was his response. He said to America, the fight is here. I need ammunition. I don't need a ride. What? The fight is here. I need ammunition. Help me out here. I don't need a ride. I'm not going anywhere. And in one moment, he became a hero to his people and to the world. Why? Why is that? The reason why he became a hero is because when you bravely endure injustice and risk your life to fight in a war that you did not start, there's nothing more inspirational than that. Amen? Amen. Nothing more. And so this is what it looks like to embrace the breaking. And so my hope today, and, and pray for me that I do this justice. All right, but, but what I want to do today is I want to give you ammunition. All right, I want to give you ammunition. We're going to look at an encounter that Jesus had with a woman who was broken. And in John chapter 4, Jesus shows up 
uh, to this uh, woman's city because he knew that she would be there. And, uh, you know, Brandon last week urged you guys to uh, embrace your inner brokenness, you know, through succumbing to the, or rather than succumbing to the pressure of perfection and performance. My challenge to you today is to embrace the brokenness that is revealed to you through marriage. Everyone say marriage. marriage. And I just want to make this declaration right here, right now, that the family is represented in this house. The marriage is represented in this house. Then when we stumble upon trouble, when we begin to have hard times, when things get really hard for us, we will be the type of people who will look our spouses in the eyes and we will say, I do not need a ride. I'm not going anywhere. The fight is here. I need ammunition. Amen. And so turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to John chapter 4. And let me just give you some context as we get started here. Uh, Jesus, Jesus arrives at this, this well at about noon, and he waits. And this woman approaches by herself to draw water. Now, right away, we know that this woman is a social outcast. And the reason why we know is because she's coming to this well alone and because of the time she's coming to the well. Right Now, women didn't come to the well by themselves, and they certainly didn't come at this time of the day. It's too hot right, in that uh, area of the world. And so we know that she's an outcast, and, and it's believed that the reason why she's coming at this time of the day is because she's trying to avoid the other women who go in the cool of the day. All right? All right. Then something else interesting happens. So it's not about her being alone, and it's not about her uh, going at the time she went. Then she begins to have a conversation with Jesus. Now, Jews don't talk to Samaritans. All right? They have this long historical beef. All right. Uh, but not only uh, do Jews not talk to Samaritans, but men don't talk to women in this culture. Right. So there's all kinds of religious and moral uh, fouls that are happening here. Yet Jesus initiates a conversation with her anyway, which I love. I love this. All right. So starting in verse seven of John chapter four. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself and also did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I don't get thirsty and won't have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, hey, go, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. All right, let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the people of God. I thank you for this time that we have to be together. But ultimately, Lord, this is about you. I thank you that you are not a remote sovereign. Lord, that you show up in our lives. Not only do you show up in our lives, you know, we would, we would hope that you would show up when we have all our things together. But you tend to show up, God, when we are broken. So as we look at this interaction with this uh, lady here, and as we just look at, Lord, even our own lives, may we see the ways in which you want to show up and heal us in the areas where we are most broken. Lord God, and help us to be people who embrace that and walk with you in it. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. So this poor lady, she's by herself, and she's devastated. And Jesus comes to her, and he basically becomes her marriage counselor. He becomes her marriage counselor. And there's a couple things that I want you to see in this interaction. The first thing is I want you to see the compassion of Jesus for those of us who are struggling, who have failed in marriage, right? Marriage is tough, okay? Understatement, understatement of the year, okay? 
Marriage is tough. Marriage is, and I, and I love this quote. This is a quote by Paul Tripp. Marriage is a beautiful thing that only reaches what God designed it to be through the methodology of a painful process. Amen. And all the married folks said, amen, amen. 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 Right? You know, on this lady's social media uh, relationship status, it didn't say single. No, it said it's complicated, right? <laughs> it's complicated. And I really believe that, you know, she can relate to many people in our culture today. I mean, this, this woman has been married before, and now she refuses to get married, right? And so what we see today in our culture are people uh, who kind of fall into this ditch on, on either side. That on, on one side, you know, we, we get into marriages, we jump into marriages, and maybe there's red flags, maybe there's some, you know, unhealthy stuff that's going on, but we jump into marriages pretty quickly, like way too quickly. Or on the other side, you know, we, we have many of us who just try to avoid marriage altogether. Amen? That's what it looks like, right? But I'm glad that we serve a compassionate God, right? That Jesus doesn't come to us in our weaknesses and in our failures. And although he can point out every single thing that we've done wrong, he doesn't do that, right? Because look at this woman, right? No one wanted anything to do with her, not the irreligious or the religious. And guess who came walking up to her that day? God. God. And so we see the compassion of Jesus for those who are struggling. But secondly, I want you to see this. I want you to see that marriage is a struggle for all who enter it. All right. It's a struggle. It's a struggle for all who enter it. Uh, Tim Keller in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, which I think is the best book on marriage out. But you guys know I love Tim Keller. All right, but it's a great book. But he gives us an analogy and he gives us a quote uh, that will bring us home as we talk about the struggle and the breaking that happens in marriage. All right, so I want you guys to, to get... Get, get in the spaceship with me, all right? I'm gonna give you the analogy, all right? Think of an old bridge over a stream. And imagine that there are structural defects in the bridge that are hard to see. You know, there may be hairline fractures that a very close inspection would reveal, but to the naked eye, there's nothing wrong. But now see a 10-ton Mack truck drive onto the bridge. What will happen? The pressure from the weight of the truck will open those hairline fractures so they can be seen. The structural defects will be exposed for all to see because of the strain the truck puts on the bridge. And suddenly, you can see where all the flaws are. And so the truck didn't create the weaknesses, it revealed them. When you get married, your spouse is like a 10-ton Mack truck. (laughs) driving right through your heart. You knew it was coming. And so marriage, marriage will bring out the worst in you. Newsflash. Okay, it will bring out the worst in you. And so it doesn't create the weaknesses, though you may blame your spouse for all of your blow-ups. Okay. It reveals them. That's what it does. Here's the quote that he gives. Uh, Stanley Harwa is a professor of ethics at Duke University, and he famously said this. He said, destructive to marriage is the self-fulfillment ethic that assumes marriage and the family are uh, primarily institutions of personal fulfillment necessary for us to become whole and happy. The assumption is that there is someone just right for us to marry and that if we look closely enough, we will find the right person. The moral assumption overlooks a crucial aspect to marriage. It fails to appreciate the fact that we always marry the wrong person. We never know whom we marry, we just think we do. Or even if we marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. For marriage, being the enormous thing that it is, means that we are not the same person after we've entered it. And so the primary problem is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. We can probably shut the service down right there. (laughs) Marriage is difficult. And it's a struggle because we are all sinners. We are all selfish, right? and we are all strangers. All right, so I just wanna look at these three, examine them real quick, and I'll get out of your way. All right, so first, we marry marry sinners. Now, 
when Stanley Harwa says that we all marry the wrong person, I, I think he does that in order to get our attention, right? And what he's trying to do is he's trying to dispel this myth that if you, if you marry someone that you think you're really co- compatible with, like if you really think, man, I nailed this, right? If you marry someone uh, who you think is the right one, right, uh, he wants to dispel the myth that you will be free from sharp conflicts. But if the Bible is right, that all human beings are sinners, if it's right about that, then no two sinners are ever naturally compatible. All right. All right. Simple people will always be rubbing each other the wrong way and blaming the other person. That's just how it works. All right. And so we all marry sinners. Secondly, we marry a selfish person. Now, we establish the fact that two people who enter into marriage are spiritually broken by sin, which, among other things, means to be self-centered. Right. Uh, one author put it this way, which I love. He said, why should neurotic, selfish, immature people suddenly become angels when they fall in love? <laughs> All right. And so as I thought about selfishness, you know, selfishness is the ever present enemy of every marriage. It is. This is the issue. All right. And so as I, I was thinking about this, I was like, maybe I can give some examples. Right. Because I knew you guys would be looking at me like you didn't know what I was talking about. All right. So I said, maybe I'll just give some examples. Maybe I can just peg them in their seat, right, where they sit, okay? So I'm, let me just read a list. All right, I want to see if you can find yourself in this list real quick, all right? <clears throat> so we tend to be dogmatic and always sure of every point of our beliefs. We tend to be fault-finding, prone to self-pity, and never satisfied. We tend to need a lot of praise and are easily offended. We tend to talk a lot about ourselves and our poor listeners, We tend to be willful, always insisting on our own way. We tend to be ungenerous with our praise and encouragement, tending instead to be scornful. We tend to be slow to admit when we're in the wrong, and repentance is always traumatic, never a relief. We tend to either enjoy confrontation too much or else refuse to ever do it. Both are actually thinking more of yourself than the other person, by the way. And so how'd you do? Did you find yourself up there? Now, now let, me, let me tell you this. If while I was reading that, you were able to find your spouse, <laughs> then you're proving my point. Okay, you're proving my point for me. All right, see, the more, the more self-centered you are, listen to this, the more self-centered you are, the less aware you are of selfishness in yourself. And the less self-centered you are, the more you sense selfishness in yourself. All right. And so we marry a sinner. uh, We marry a selfish person and we marry a stranger. Harwa, he finishes his quote with a dagger when he says, the primary problem is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married to. Um, You know, I have been married to Amy almost 17 years. I know. Josh, last week, he said miracle. I know. And I'm, I'm with you, buddy. <laughs> miracle. I know. <clears throat> man, and sh- man, she has changed a lot in 17 years, right? And so have I. I've changed a lot as well. Um, and so th- this is just how it works. We, we change a lot. Aging bodies, babies and children, in-laws, work and career, right? All change us and, and it requires us to constantly recalibrate the marriage relationship. And so what we need then is not a perfect spouse who never changes because that person doesn't exist, right? But what we really need is wisdom. We need the ability to repent and we need a sustained commitment to our wedding promises. That's, that's, what we, that's what we need, right? You will need to ask God to help you accept the inevitable changes in each other as he also aids you in remaining unchangeably committed to one another, all right? So this, this woman was married to five different men, okay, five different men. And I love what the late um, author and theologian Lewis Meads said about this. He said, my wife has lived with with at least five different men since we were wed, and each of the five has been me, all right? So we understand that. So what was happening with this lady, huh? What was going on with her? What I believe is that 
This is a woman who kept bringing all these men into her life. And as she brought them into her life, she would squeeze them. And not enough of God would come out, right? But instead, she would see sin. She would see selfishness. She would see strangers. And so then she would go to the next man and to the next man and to the next and the next. And finally, Jesus comes up to her and he says, hey, hey, you're drinking from the wrong source. If you keep drinking from men, you will keep being thirsty. I am the one that you're longing for. I am the one that you need to drink of. That's what he was saying. And the reason why we know that this one conversation, this one interaction was so transformational for her is because right after this conversation, she runs to her city and she tells the people of her city, she says, come and see the man who told me everything about everything I'd have ever done. And she became a catalyst. She became a reason why many people in her city came and received Jesus themselves. That's what she did. And so if we know that marriage will bring out the worst in us, and that is difficult, and that it brings us into the closest possible contact with a sinful, selfish stranger, then what's the fix? The fix is gospel reenactment. It's a ministry mindset versus a consumer mindset. Let me tell you what I'm talking about here. See, in marriage, we we tend to say, I will be the spouse I should be if you are the spouse you should be. All right? That's a consumer mindset. Consumer mindset. And if that is your mode of operation, if that is the operating system of your heart, if you really think that way, that I will be the spouse I ought to be to the degree that you are the spouse that you should be, then I just want to challenge you with something this morning. And listen, I love you. I'm your brother. All right. So just hear me on this. But if that's really how you think, I want to challenge you in this, that you need to to admit to God that his love for you is too abstract and that your fellowship with him is too weak. And it's causing you to put pressure on things in your life to make you happy, your spouse being the main one. If your spouse is the center of your life, you're going to struggle in marriage. Why? Because you're elevating your spouse to God status, which is very dangerous, right? That's what you're doing. You're elevating them to God status and no one can hold up under the weight of perfection. No one can bear the freight of divine expectations. No one can do it. And so they're going to let you down. And that which you idolize, you ultimately demonize. And so when they let you down, they're going to crush you. You know what you're going to do? You're going to turn around and crush them back. But unless Jesus Christ demotes your spouse, moves your spouse out of the center of your life, unless he does that, you're going to struggle. Right? Jesus' ultimate spousal love should so move you that you can handle life when your spouse isn't being what he or she should be. And only if you let him be the ultimate spouse in your life can you be any kind of decent spouse yourself. That's how it works. So to the singles in the room, so you're single, you're like, oh my gosh, why did I come today? <laughs> Great. Maybe your question is, how can I handle this journey of life if I want to be married and I'm not? How do I do this? Like, like I know there's someone in this room right here, right now, who's saying, man, I want to be married. You go to weddings, and at weddings you say, man, I, I can't stand this. When's my wedding day coming? Will I ever get married? And if that's you, the same principle applies. That if it's true that you're going to struggle in marriage unless Jesus is the ultimate source of love and significance in your life, then you need to constantly be saying this to yourself. You need to be saying to yourself, there is only one person in the universe 
who can give my soul what it longs for the most and he awaits me. I can read about it in Revelations 21 and 22, right? That my wedding day is coming no matter what. It's coming no matter what. And it's the only wedding day that I really need. Oh, man. You guys stand with me? Please keep in mind, please keep in mind that Jesus Christ made a covenant with his father to come down to earth and to make us his partners. And when he got here, we crucified him. Now, maybe you think your spouse is crucifying you, right? But in Jesus's case, it really did happen. His spouse really did crucify him. Jesus got into the worst marriage. Jesus got into the marriage from hell. Jesus got into a marriage that sent him to hell. His marriage with us. In the last days of Jesus' life, actually just hours before his crucifixion, he could be found at a dinner table, sitting with his disciples. And at this dinner table, you know what he did? He broke bread with them. And he said, this bread is my broken body. Take and eat. Then he took wine and he said, this cup is a cup of my my life poured out for you. Take it and drink. You know what he was doing? He was embracing the breaking. From there, as they walked out of there, they went to the Mount of Olives and he went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the book of Matthew, it shows us what happens in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus prays three times. And the first time he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Lord, he says, Father, if this cup can pass for me, I would love that. But ultimately, I just want your will done. The second time he prays, he says, if this cup can't pass unless I drink it, let your will be done, Father. The third time he prays, we don't even get to know what he prays about. But what we know is after he's done, he gets up and he goes to his disciples and he says, let's go. It's go time. In the book of Luke, we see in this instance in the Garden of Gethsemane that after Jesus gets done praying, the Bible says that an angel comes down and begins to minister to him and strengthen him. Now contrast this with an instance that he has with Peter just moments later where Peter tries to protect him as he's being captured. And Jesus has to look to him and he has to say, hey, I could get legions of angels right now to come down and take care of this. But how will the scriptures be fulfilled? And so what's happening in the Garden of Gethsemane? I'll tell you what's happening. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in so many words, Jesus is saying to his father, The fight is here. I need ammunition. I don't need a ride. That's what he's saying. Jesus would then go to a cross and he would die for all of us. For all of us, he would die. And when Jesus hung on the cross, it was as if he was kneeling down on one knee proposing to us that's what the cross is family it's his ultimate proposal to me and you and in this one act this one thing that Jesus did he became a hero to his people and to the whole world why (laughs) because when you bravely endure injustice You not only risk your life, but you give it to fight a war that you didn't start. Nothing's more inspirational than that. Do you see him staying in a terrible marriage with you? Do you see him giving us the ultimate faithfulness, the ultimate spousal love? Do you see him being faithful to his covenant with us? Does that move you? 
I'll tell you how you'll know that it has. I'll tell you how you know that it's moved you is when your spouse reveals themselves to be the sinful, selfish stranger that they are, you will do for them what God and Christ has done for you. You will roll up your sleeves, put the bandana around your forehead, put your eye black on, double night your, your combat boots, and you will love your spouse as God and Christ loves you. Amen. Amen. Jesus is our ammunition. Amen. He gives us both the power and the pattern for marriage. So if you can do this, if you, if you can do this, see, marriage was designed a specific way. <clears throat> marriage was designed to break you down and to build you back up again. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> it's always funny when, when we do weddings. They're so beautiful and amazing. But weddings are rigged, right? <laughs> God's going to break you down and build you back up again. So don't run from the breaking. Embrace it. Amen. And if you do that, God will use marriage to have the most profound impact on your life. Amen. So we're going to pray together. Um, our prayer team is going to come down to the altar. But if you're here today and you would say, Sean, this message was for me. This message was for me. I needed to hear this. I just want you to slip your hand up. We just want to pray for you. Amen. 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 Uh, Amy, before I got here, she told me um, that she believes that there is a grace in the room for healing. So let today be that day for you. That if not just your marriage is killing you, but life is killing you, I want you to come and partner with us. We just want to pray with you. We want to contend with you. Amen. So this is my last call. If you're here and you say, Sean, I need Jesus. I need him to be very real. I need him to not be abstract, but very real and personal to me right now. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray. That's all I want to do. I see you, sister. I see you, sister. I see you. Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you for giving us the ultimate example in Jesus. Someone who did not despise the call to come here and even with the worst of spouses, us as humanity, go all the way. Lord, empower us today, strengthen us today. Help us to see the fight that we're in. Help us, Lord, not to entertain the voices that tell us that we can evacuate, that we can run, that we can get out of here. No, 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 the fight is here. Help us to see, God, that the fight is here. And it may not just be in marriages, but maybe just someone just needs to hear that in their spirit today. Maybe you're here and you wanna quit. The fight is here. Lord, may your grace be upon your people. May they feel you, sense you, and know your presence, Lord God. That you did not spare your son to save them. And so we know that you would not withhold yourself from them. And so help them today, Lord God. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so again, our prayer team is down here. We would love to partner with you. Again, these are safe people that are here. We would love to contend with you. God bless you guys. Thank you guys so much for coming to The Rock. Amen.